All right. You guys ready? Staff ready? Paul, ready? All right. Let's see here. Record. Yeah, started. It is 6.30. Let's call the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. I will start with roll call. Brooks. Here. Chuck. Present. Brian. Present. Thomas. Here. Alyssa. Here. Rob. We have a quorum. I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. I shall move. Second. Motion is second to approve the agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the November 17th regular meeting. change. Perfect. Um, Could you get your microphone? I have one change in the part where we were talking about the fence, um, and now I can't find it. Gas station, neighborhood business. Uh, it says, okay, uh, uh, in which the smooth, Ryan constructed fence on his property in which the smooth side does not face out towards the required by city ordinance, but what we were specifically talking about were the posts were on the outside instead of the inside. And I really think it should say that instead. Got it? It'll be on the recorder and then Melissa will pick that up. And on YouTube, it'll be everywhere. It's awesome. So is that a motion with the change? It is. I move. I move to approve the minutes. minutes with that change. Second. Motion and second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Item number five: public comments. This is where, if you would like to draw, address the commission, you can do so now. I have a couple from staff. Oh. Mentioned. So what? right now there is a Redwood Ranch public meeting being held up at tailgaters. If you are here for that, you are in the wrong location. That's up at tailgaters, so you still have time. I think it goes till seven. So if you're here for that, that's where that is. Also, mm -hmm. the Brandon Development Foundation, the Chamber, Sioux Metro, and Sioux Valley Energy are sponsoring a small business basics class. So if you are a small business owner, just starting one, your existing one, if you just have an idea that's been floating around in your head for two years, whether it makes sense, it is either 50 or 60, depending if you're a member or not of those organizations, for six sessions that are three hours each about finance statements, business networking, taxes, marketing, human resources, insurance, business plans. If you are at all interested in potentially starting a business that is available to you and there is a cap so if you are interested in it you can there's a registration link or you can just email me directly at with the city so that registration window is currently open it closes right just before Christmas there are flyers in the back if you are interested in that so that is being offered as well and that will be hosted out at Sioux Valley Energy's building just west of town so. the the program is being taught by SDSU? Correct. Did you say, yes, $50 to enter? Or yep, if, it's and 60 if you're, pro if you're a non-member of one of those organizations. So I'm guessing unless you're an established business, you're probably not a member of the chamber. And if but. you know anybody that's looking to start a business or is interested, please reach out to the city. This is a pretty good program. Yep, and it, even if it is, it's, they'll kind of look at your idea People with experiences of business plans will be able to give you a good sense of whether your business is a business that makes sense or they can give you some pointers on where to start and where to get financing. So help you get off the ground if you're interested, if you have an idea and want to get something going. It doesn't mean you have to have a, a business in a building. If It could be a home business. It's, if you want to start an in-home daycare, see if it makes sense or some in-home whatever. It's yes. just a thing to get some discussion off the ground. Sweet. Anything else? Anyone else? Okay. We'll move on to item number six. General business district dwelling units. 
Go ahead, Patrick. So someone was going to be here to discuss this. It's I don't necessarily see them here. So they they wanted to talk to you, and if they do show up, feel free. But so they wanted to talk to you about general business, specifically in the general business district. As a conditional use, there is dwellings. There, they wanted to talk to you about the shall be above the first floor portion of that. Whether you would, you all would be willing to allow those to be on the main floor. They were interested in buying a, potentially buying a business here in town that recently closed. I don't want to go too much into detail just because that's kind of there what they're sorting out, but recently closed it, at one, they do have apparently three bedrooms, a kitchen and a bathroom. And at one point it was used as a dwelling and that had a conditional use permit. But since then the shall be above the first floor language was added. So that would no longer be capable as, of being a dwelling. So the conditional use permit expired. And so that's, they wanted to talk about whether you all would be open to amending out that first floor requirement. Anyone? There's a residence there right now. Use your mic, please. There's a residence there right now. There is not a residence there right now, but the building was built in such a way that would allow a residence potentially. So this sort of goes, we've had discussions for probably a decade over doing um, mixed use buildings in general business, light industrial, heavy industrial for people who would like to run a small business and would like to live in it. Sort of like back in the day when the funeral director used to live in the, right? Or the gas station attendant used to live behind the gas station. See, we don't really allow for that currently. Does the... Does the funeral director not live in the funeral parlor anymore? So we have he people did. sitting around the city of Brandon who are living in businesses now and people who historically have lived in businesses. Some in industrial parks, some in general business. Some of them have told us about it, some of them have not. Sort of like people running businesses out of their houses. We'd like to think that they would all come in here, but... Sometimes they don't. Does anybody have any other thoughts on this? First of all, would you be open to allowing it? Because it sounds as though we allow it on a second floor. If they came in and sought a conditional use permit in general business for a dwelling above the first floor, there is an avenue for that. Is this a single floor building in the first place? Yes. So they'd have to build a second? Currently, yes. They would, if in order to have a dwelling, they would have to build a second floor. How many square feet are we talking about for the whole structure? I don't know. It would apply potentially anywhere, regardless of square footage. But I, I don't know how much they would want me to go into what they're. So if we at, so if we visited a mixed use situation, we could determine what the square footage of living unit could be, what the square footage of workspace could be. We currently do that with home occupations. If somebody wants to have a, a, a business in their house, we dictate how much of the house they can use for that business. Now, do we go in there every day and make sure that they aren't spread out over so many square feet? No. Good night. Yes. You don't have to get buzzed. Um, mm -hmm. I would possibly be open to this, um, but it would have to be, in my mind, it would have to be um, owner occupied dwelling. Okay. So that, you know, whoever owned the business would be the only one allowed living in it. And then uh, we would have to put some stipulation on what percentage of the overall building would be allocated to the dwelling versus the business. Makes sense. And could we do that with a conditional use? 
We certainly could, yes. It depends on how we would want to write it, so whether or not the staff could just approve or if they could all just come to conditional uses if they wanted to do a mixed use. Just for the record, so heavy industrial currently with the CUP, as Brian mentioned, owner occupied dwelling unit shall occupy the lesser of 1,300 square feet or 25% of the building footprint. That's in HI right now. But only HI? Probably a lot too. Okay. And is that through conditional use or yes. just yes. allowed? It, CUP. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'd be open to something very similar to that. I would too. For mm -hmm. CV. But we don't dictate in heavy industrial, light industrial, that they have to be on the second floor? No, sir. It isn't, it isn't light industrial. So. Okay. Well, there you go. Does that help? I want to say that was a, a fairly recent amendment, just because I, I remember going through that with you all when I was the heavy and light industrial job. we talked yes. about it yep. it is a fairly recent one I think so about a year ago. oh I might not have been here hmm. so based on what I'm hearing the PNC is open to the idea if it is owner occupied and it can be if if you want to have a size limitation or PNC is open to it. So the person that requested it while they are not here, if they are interested in pursuing it, they can certainly talk to you all more. Would you be interested in me putting together a draft? Sure. sure. Okay. So hopefully the person that requested it then will provide us some feedback on that draft. Perfect. And just to be clear, this is only for first floor. We wouldn't change anything about dwelling units on second floor or above, correct? That would and that's a, that would be would still be permitted. Would you want to limit those above the first floor size, or are we writing a special rule for just first floors? I just just I first floors. First floor. <clears throat> okay. You got it. I think we're done. All right, item number seven, neighborhood business district ordinance draft. Has everybody up here had a chance to review it? Does anybody have any thoughts about it? We, we have received a couple of public comments and those are in front of you. One from, uh, so those, those have been provided to PNZ. So on the current draft, the biggest change is The, the size. There's a table on page 16 that goes into page 17 of the packet that adds 15,000 square feet or 33% of the lot, which is ever less as a maximum building footprint. I left open the minimum lot with front yard setback, side yard setback, rear yard setback for some conversation. And at the end of the packet for this topic, there is a things to consider table if those are questions that were brought up by both PNC members and members of the public. I tried to summarize them. If I missed any, feel free to chime in. But those being, we talked about the maximum building footprint as a percentage of the lot. Were we referring to the entire lot for that percentage or the buildable area of that lot being the lot area minus setbacks equals buildable area. So then that was brought up and how do we feel about the list of permitted and conditional uses? One of the public comments specifically mentioned appliance store. I'm not sure if they were objecting to the entirety of that use or things ab about it. So I brought up, would that change if they had an, an on-site repair component? Would that use be acceptable for, if it was just a retail business minus repair component. What do we think about the inhabitants of the dwelling? We just kind of talked about a mixed use. Are we set on those being owner occupied? Are you open to tenants? Are you open to employees? Just your thoughts. 
what are your thoughts on setbacks and minimum lot widths for lar lots larger than 10,000? Should setbacks increase as they get larger? Do the maximum building footprint sizes make sense? Just, you have some comments from the appraiser that are in front of you as a reference point. I did some kind of rough drawing on the Minnehaha County GIS. The fire department building on North Sioux, the volunteer fire department building on North Sioux Boulevard is roughly 15,5-ish. So that's roughly what a 15,000 square building looks like, just to provide some visual context. So the conversation of trees came up. What do we want to do about buffer trees? Trees are a bit more difficult to regulate than a fence just because trees grow, they die, they sometimes take 20 years to grow, they produce leaves that would blow into neighbors' yards. Do we want to regulate buffer trees? In the last draft we eliminated both buffer trees and berms so that potentially something to talk about. How do we want to regulate a freestanding sign on a neighborhood business lot, size, height, and I'm, I'm open to general thoughts on what we want to talk about. So I will turn it over to you all. Well, you just listed like 25 things. They're written down in front of you. You can talk about them or not, or, or I just threw them out there to get conversation rolling. Whether they are all issues or not, I don't know, but so this is kind of where the most of the feedback we received from the public was about lot size. Most were not in favor of larger than 10. One mentioned 20, which I'm not sure where that came from since we kind of kept it at 10, but the general impression was not in favor of large buildings. So I will open it to public comments and well let's start up here do you guys have any comments up here anything that he just listed all those things I would eliminate the trees and the berms no trees no berms and go just with fences mm -hmm. we have discussed that berms tend to be a drainage issue and trees do live and die so, yes. So do fences, but they can be replaced. Okay. Anybody else have anything else? He went through a lot. I figured out my lot that I live on is 10,000 square feet. Okay. So, if we say 50% and we don't subtract... Um, setbacks things from that then that would be we would allow somebody to buy my lot and the lot next to it and build a building the size of my lot because that would be 50 percent now that seems to me to be too much I would say 50 percent of the buildable space my husband pointed out, uh, put me onto the American Planning Association website. So I looked Ooh. around there a bit, and that was cool. And I noticed that some cities limit not by the size of the lot, not by the size of the building, but by the number of employees. Usually 10 at the most. In fact, what else did I find out on there? And this was an old re older report, so this is, I don't know what Fort Worth is currently, but Fort Worth limited the building size to 2,500 square feet, Maricopa County to 3,000. What are you talking about? In, Neighborhood in business districts. They have these? Yes, they do. Huh. Or they, they were, yeah. I, like I say, this is an older report. I didn't look to see what their current ordinance says. But in some cities, neighborhood business ends up just being the four lots at the corner of an intersection. In all of them that I looked at, the purpose of these neighborhood business in these cities is to provide 
essentials within walking distance of residential. And the only kind of businesses that were allowed were businesses that if you walked up to the store and bought some stuff, you could carry it home on you or put it inside your car. So a refrigerator wouldn't count. Things like a small convenience store, bakery, somebody who does alterations to clothing. This is the kind of things that they were, that they were talking about. Okay. This yeah. is in, just in Fort Worth or somewhere this, else? Uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, primarily for the conduct of retail trade in outlying shopping areas with emphasis on daily necessities for the convenience of the surrounding residential area. Chicago Heights, Illinois, intended that retail uses be limited to those by pedestrians and to those who do not interfere with pedestrian movement. South Euclid, Ohio, in close proximity to and catering to the ordinary shopping needs of the immediate neighborhood. Uh, what did I say? Maricopa County limited to 3,000 square feet for a business. Uh, permitted, permitted uses. This is a generalization that the American Planning Association report made. Uh, permitted uses in general, uh, core convenience stores with such items as groceries, drugs, hardware, clothing, businesses performing convenience services, small shops selling shopping goods, non-retail uses. Um, in general, according to the American Planning Association report, uh, neighborhood businesses have the following characteristics in common. Usually small enough to be, that items you purchase are small enough to be carried away on foot or in an automobile. Most of the stores do not attract large numbers of automobiles and service to these stores is relatively infrequent and seldom involves trucking, heavy trucking. So semis don't deliver to them. Uh, Primarily for pedestrian shoppers. Few ordinances permit, permit drive-in uses other than filling stations, small in size. Some ordinances specify maximum permissible floor area for particular uses, and like I say, the ones I saw were Fort Worth, which was 2,500 square feet, Maricopa County, which was 3,000 square feet. Now, could you put, could you, could you adhere to the stuff that this says on a 3.5 acre lot? I also saw that website. I saw many other websites for municipalities. Most of them are municipalities much larger than what we're dealing with here. Um, Correct. And my concerns with a lot of those when they start talking about serving pedestrian. This is Brandon, South Dakota. We have winters here. We don't have the we don't have the housing density to support a business that's only going to support walk up traffic. I mean, you're only attracting people from a couple blocks away. No no business is going to be able to be self sufficient to support be supported by simply walk up traffic in Brandon, South Dakota. Uh, most of those places also have much smaller lots, much smaller setbacks, much right. higher density. Even though there are one, they probably have apartments mixed in. They have, yes, yeah. I so agree. There, there was some good information on that website and other websites, um, but you have to kind of take it in the context of the municipality that they're going into. Um, so I, I think we're on the right track on the types of uses that we're, we have listed. Um, some of them had much more extensive and detailed list listings. Um, ours is a little bit, maybe a little bit more general, but covers those detailed lists. Um, also, some of them had uh, density, building density in them. Um, you mean in terms of the development? In terms of how much building on the lot. Okay. And I think we are pretty much in line with what I was seeing for most of them that did that. They, they call it FAR um, or other acronyms, but basically kind of the same thing there in that the, most of them were in that 35 to 50 percent 
coverage. Um, some of them were on total building area, some of them were on footprint area. Um, you know, so it's all across the board on, on how they all do it. But I think probably the biggest thing I got out of it was the intent of the neighborhood business district and the uses that are allowed. And, um, I think pretty much everything on our list was pretty consistent with what I was seeing. Um, so many of them also had as a conditional use for the drive up, similar to what we have. If you have a have a, have a drive up window, uh, which we have currently in our at this stage of our draft anyway. So. Okay. Anybody else? Peruse websites. No. No. All right. I'll open it up. Who would like to start? Anyone? Come on up. Beautiful. <laughs> um, no, first of all, Patrick, I'll have to apologize to you. I'm sorry that my email wasn't very clear whenever I sent it to you. I'm working on a couple of deadlines cutting yep. at the end of the day. But, um, my response, no, it was great. Um, Can you see your name and address? Yep. Riley Walls, uh, 609 North Tamarack Avenue. Um, so first I'd like to apologize. I haven't been to the last couple of meetings. I've been at a lot of conferences and for some reason they like the first and third week of every month. So um, I kind of, uh, going off of what Alyssa was saying, um, I feel like a lot of the intent of this site needs to be kind of reconsidered, or not reconsidered, but refocused. Um, looking back at what we have, I think is a great intent. Um, but going off of that and with that said, um, I'm looking for some clarification on some things and I have some comments on the permitted use uh, uses in businesses. Um, first is the appliance store. Uh, I agree with Alyssa. I think that a lot of the um, appliance store is pretty general. I feel like you could categorize hardware stores into that as well because most hardware stores do sell appliances as well. Um, there are shipments that go in and out every you know night over the weekend, mostly by semis as well. So I would say that if we are looking at services that serve a uh, surrounding neighborhood and fit within an R1 context, then appliance stores don't necessarily make sense to me. Um, also, accessory buildings, just looking for clarification on that. Those are not allowed, right? Right, OK. Um, convenience store, um, I kind of got clarified with that a little bit. Um, I'm trying to see where we're separating that from grocery store and how that is limited foods. Um, just some food for thought. Um, uh, grocery store, I feel like could get a little bit big. Um, a convenience store kind of covers a lot of what groceries already kind of go into. Um, as far as neighborhood utilities, um, I personally feel like this should be a conditional use. Uh, a lot of times I know I feel like within the neighborhood and which it serves, they should have a say in whether or not there's going to be some sort of treatment plant behind them. Um, there was a comment made last time about alcohol uh, and restaurants. I feel like this concern is more along the lines of operations of business, so how late a business is open. I feel like obviously the later a business is open and there's alcohol served, more trouble is going to happen, of course. Um, Exercise, I don't really have any problem with that, uh, gyms. My only concern is, once again, hours of operation. Lots of uh, gyms are 24-hour businesses now, so I think looking back at the intent of what we want this zoning district to be should be considered when it comes to these kinds of hours. Um, barriers, I did make the comment about bringing back uh, uh, natural barriers such as trees just because I feel like that could be another tool, as Lee said, tool in the box for people to use to solve certain situations such as light pollution. Um, say you do have an LED sign or something along those lines, uh, you could always use that as a barrier to block that. May not be right away, but patience, right? Um, also, to avoid kind of more, or going into the actual square footage conversation, um, another good reference is the uh, strip mall that's over on Split Rock, right next to the Gruff. That one is 13,000 square feet. If we're looking at this zoning as something that is fixed within a R1 development, kind of surrounded by it, 
um, is the intent to have these uh, strip malls into it. To me, it doesn't necessarily make sense, but as you can see that as an example, I feel like 13,000 square feet is pretty big enough for a decent sized strip mall. Um, if anything, the Gruff and Arby's is 8,000 square feet. So that is also kind of condensing it down if we do want strip malls. Um, but as a young person moving to new communities and all that, I feel like everybody can agree that strip malls aren't necessarily the best looking things. Um, a lot of young people are looking for kind of unique neighborhoods, uh, not necessarily cooker, cookie cutter anymore. Um, I know I threw a lot at you, sorry, bear with me. Um, those are the comments I have though, but thank you for your consideration. If you have any follow-up questions, I can. Mike Trailer, 613 North Tamarack. Um, Riley hit a lot of the points really that I intended to. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, let's keep in mind when we're talking about the zone that it's for the city in general, not just the past flower lot. Um, you know, he touched on the, the size of Gruff and Arby's together being 8,000 square feet. Do we really want to go any bigger than that on a neighborhood business <coughs> kind of lot? What, what number did you just say? 8,000. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, we talk about, or you've got in there potential for having up to a 15,000 square foot building or 33,000, or sorry, 33% of a lot, whichever is smaller. Well, in order to even get to 15,000 square feet, you have to have an acre lot. Does that really belong in a neighborhood business? I, I really don't think so. Um, I really didn't have any other points that he didn't talk about already, so I won't go there. Um, for the most part, I agree with the uses that you guys came up with. Um, I do share the same sentiment about the appliance build or the appliance sales. Does that really need to be in the neighborhood? I don't. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mike Tony. 500 East Mayberry. Uh, I sent you guys a, a spreadsheet. Um, I kind of looked at some of the neighborhood or the businesses in, in kind of, some of them aren't in neighborhood areas, but businesses that you might think would fit in there. And few of them had square foot over 10,000 square feet. Um, and even like the, um, the Brandon Pharmacy Scooters building, um, that's only 8,700 square feet. You know, they have, they have four businesses in there. Um, I don't, I don't think that going over 10,000 square feet is something that's needed in a neighborhood business district. Um, one thing that we've asked for is green space. Uh, if you look at a lot of these businesses in town, by the time you get the building in there and parking, there really isn't any green space left and. Um, when we're talking about the North Pass Flower Trail lot, um, that, the way that they've graded it, most of that's going to flow to the north onto Redwood, and that, the more par parking lot you have there, the more flooding we're going to have at the bottom of Redwood. Um, that's been an issue or a, a concern for the neighbors since, since this conversation started. So um, anything more than 10,000 square feet, I think, is just too much. Um, 15,000 square feet, when we look at that church, that's 16,000 square foot. That's a huge building. That's not a residential building other than for a church, and that's on 11 acres. We're talking about trying to put a 15,000 square foot building on acre lots. That's a totally different picture. So um, another con uh, concern that the neighbors have uh, is daycares. I know that you guys have said, well, daycares are allowed in residential, and they, they are. You can have a daycare in your home, but the number of kids is like 10 in a home, right? 10, 12, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's limited, right? Um, building blocks is, is in a business district, and that's where that type of facility should be. We don't need a 15,000 square foot facility in a residential neighborhood 
if you allow daycares, I certainly understand that. Neighborhoods have kids, right? I, I get that, but can we have a conversation about what the scope of that should look like? Not unlimited. Are they going to allow play areas in setbacks? Are are there going to be other conditions that that will be applied, or uh, or is there just if it's on the lot, they can do what they want? I guess that's that's certainly a concern for especially those neighbors that are um, going to be right next to the lot that they'd be building on. So um, that'd be just something I'd like to have a, a conversation with, what kind of setbacks and, and other conditions might be applied to daycares in a neighborhood business district. Um, anyway, other than that, I, I do think that you guys are working really hard and, and you, you have people coming from every different direction and I appreciate the amount of work you've been putting into this and ask to be patient with us because we're just people too. So are we. <laughs> no, me, no. I'm a robot, but. <laughs> Anybody else? Shauna Shipper, 601 Tamarack. So maybe I just, I always just want some clarification here. So, any, any residents could become general business if they come across to you guys and they say, yeah, I wanna, my son wants to start a tattoo company in my basement, is that correct? Okay. Uh, sorry. It could be or a flower shop or basement. whatever, right? Nope. They have to come for a conditional use for a home occupation okay. in the house. Okay. Yes. So they do that, and that's fine. Um, but then they can do what they want. So now their business grows. So if they have a one-acre lot, like the people on Country Club, right? They have a nice one big lot. They can pave that and build on it. Is that what this is saying? No. Okay, why not? You mean to I'm sorry, could I, could I interject before you? Yeah, yeah, it? I just want some clarification. Can I, can I get you to pull up the, um, the long range plan? The 20, the 25, 2035 comprehensive plan, please, while we're addressing this. Are you no. asking if they can expand their bills, business and like put a building on their house? Well, if house they want, if they, yeah, like, they can they expand their, their house? Usually, when there's a home this, occupation, it can only, it, um, it's restricted of how much percentage of your house can be used for that in business. In this general district? In the, for a home occupation. Yes. But for, now they're changed, but if, if you wanted to change your house to general business and have, you know. You'd have to have it rezoned. Yeah. You'd have to have, yeah. yeah so we, they can come and have it rezoned. Well. Well, they can ask to have it rezoned. Yeah, whether yeah, they it'll can be ask approved to have, or not. Okay, would okay, maybe it's a flower shop. So maybe be a, whole other maybe thing a tattoo there. shop's too offensive to people. Okay, so maybe you want a flower shop or a grocery store or like a place you can go sit out your back deck and watch the golfers and drink tea. So maybe they're going to sell tea or something so, or whatever, right? Because they could come here and ask that. The... They can come here and ask anything. Okay. You can ask <laughs> right now if you want to put a flower shop in your house. If you okay. want to ask for a conditional use, okay. we would hear it. Yeah. Okay. Would but your neighbors come and say, I don't want a flower shop in my house next door to me? Probably. So would we hear that too? Yep. So I, are, what are you asking? Okay, let, I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, because really, are you, I have so are you I have asking if I, if, all right. If I have my little house, I have my house. My mm -hmm. house is 84 by 110 is my lot. Mm -hmm. It's about a quarter acre. Okay. And uh, so you, are you asking, so if I want to start, uh, uh, I'll say it again, somebody who does alterations to clothing, because I really want one of those in town. So Don't if I want to turn my house down. into that, mm -hmm. and if I came and asked to have my, just my little lot, Rezoned into mm -hmm. neighborhood, yeah. Neighbor, or if I want to make a sandwich shop like Whiffers, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Which was in a house, right? That was in anything a house, Anything on the list, right? And could I have general ju- business? Could I come in and ask just my have mm-hmm. just my lot mm-hmm. zoned as general business? Could I come in and ask just my have just my lot zoned as neighborhood business? Is yeah, that that's your my question? question. Yeah. Okay. So is that the question? Could somebody come in and say, "I just want my lot to be something in general yeah, business"? Yeah, you could ask. You could. So the reason I asked, can we bring this up? So hold on. There you go. I didn't get the God point. dang. Um, the reason I asked Tammy to bring this up. So if you look at this, this is the this is the comprehensive plan, and by state wow. statute, we're required to follow this. Um, you know, we can't we can't just all of a sudden create a an industrial area in the middle of a residential neighborhood. So this is out there. The city's had opportunity to review this. Um, the public's had opportunity to comment on this. Um, but this is this is what we have to follow. And as I look at this, when this was actually created back in 14, 15, 2014, 2015, we only had one. We only had general um, central business and general business. We had two business types. Yes. Okay, what we're trying to do here is add a third business type. And this new b- third business type is going to start to address some of these little spot pink areas that you see at intersections of collector streets. Okay, Arterial streets are, are typically still going to stay central business. You know, and that's the things like you know, the Sunshine Store, the, the Arby's, that strip mall on there, across, the, across from the school. That's central business. Now those business districts, and a lot of people say, we don't want these strip malls. Now keep in mind, in a central business, you can build right up to the property line on the front, okay? We have a front yard setback in ours. The front yard setback is the same as a residential property. And so we're keeping that green space. So that's some of the differentiators between what we're talking about here now that we're trying to create differentiating this from a central business area, okay? General business. Or sorry, general business. Okay. Sorry about that. So what we're trying to do is address some of these future spots, and in fact, if you look at this, you know, the area that we're talking about mostly here right now was identified as a business district back in 2014, 2015. So back when this was, when this was generated, I mean, this was public information. This could have been central business, but we're trying to make it less businessy and more residentially. So, when we talk about putting these things in a residential neighborhood, we're not putting them in a residential neighborhood; they're adjacent to a residential neighborhood. So, keep that in mind. We're not we're not plopping them into the middle of it. We're putting them either on the outskirts um, or at intersections where you're typically not going to want to put a house anyway. It's at the intersection of of busy streets. So, you know, just want to make sure that we're, we're all on the same context of what these are for um, and, and what we're trying to achieve here. Now, they could go in the middle of a neighborhood. They could go in the middle of a, a planned neighborhood. They could go, like I've made the reference before, that I live on the way to Robert Bennis, and there is not a single service between Holly and... Yeah. But it, it does say in here in our draft, you know, the very first par- paragraph, the last sentence of the purpose, it's anticipated but not required that this district be utilized along local and collector streets, okay? Arterial streets are major streets. That's where the general business goes. These are for the arterial streets, so it's kind of a step down in, in, in the, the scale of the streets and the, and the amount of traffic on there. So I don't think we're going to be putting this on, you know, the middle of a, of, a, of a residential street that has parking on both sides and no I, I don't think that you're gonna see somebody buy a house demolish it and build a business in the middle of a neighborhood I could see somebody doing that on the end of a street low like at the end of s- so I live one off a corner if they wanted to put a bar next to me I'd be very happy with that <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying <laughs> sure sure but I, for example, Holly she has business on only one side of the street. It's one of the main at, main roads through town. I can see someday the houses that touch Holly 
could be turned into businesses. Maybe not in the middle of the block, but the roads, well, the, the houses, the that, houses touch that touch Holly would be more likely to become general business than they would neighborhood business. It's sort of like yeah, when would, you drive down Minnesota Avenue, it used to be surrounded by houses. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think agree. there's still it's a couple of houses more left. Yeah, but it'd be their businesses now. Neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. See the like what you were reading earlier. Those those examples would be in the middle of neighborhoods, walkable, right? That's the whole point. Usually now, intersections. We we struggle here because you know we get we get most of our business development is chain restaurants that count rooftops that want a certain amount of people, and we don't necessarily have a lot of people who want to build structures for small businesses. They want 10-year leases. So, I don't know. I guess we have, we have a lot, lot to think about, I think. Because I see this utilized. I, I, I agree with Brian, though. In, in a high-density area where the, the houses are packed on top of each other, if you go to Chicago, if you go to some of these big cities, their setbacks are next to nothing. So they can cram a lot more people into a city block than we can. So these districts then service a whole lot more people. And they have condos, they have townhomes, they have all those stuff in those same districts. Public transportation. Public transportation, but yes. Not existent for, for the most part. Well, we got a city bus. We do, yeah. But I mean, I mean just it carries a person a day. I think it's the right way. See, there we go, city bus. Well used. But the majority of the people still rely on their automobile. Yeah. So. In this box that says things to consider, the first one says... Uh, what page are you on? 22. 22, okay. It's all, all, all highlighted in yellow. Oh, look at that. Yeah, that one. It says, when we discuss maximum building footprint as a percentage of the lot, we we're saying 50 maybe. Uh, are we referring to the, the whole lot or the lot that's left after we subtract the setbacks? I'm in favor of the buildable area, not the whole area. Okay. I'm in favor of the buildable area, which would be you take the how much, how big the lot is, you subtract how much the setbacks are and then you whatever you have left you can go whatever 50 percent of that okay that's what i'm in favor of is that the only thing on that list of questions you have want to speak to okay, right, now. One, one right now okay anybody else have any thoughts on that i have just i oh. I, I threw out the 50 percent at the very okay. beginning and the reason i threw that out is that's approximately what a house and the attached garage takes up on a residential lot. That was the only reason the 50% came up. Okay. So, and we've, we've kind of stayed with that, but that was the reason I brought that number up. Yeah, if you I, look, I mean, if you look at an aerial photograph and you look at a typical residential neighborhood of what's getting built now, you know, not the old lots, not the big lots, but you know, what gets built now, about half the lot is taken up by house, by building. Um, so as I've looked at it a little bit more, most of these types of businesses, you're going to struggle to get a higher density than 50%. Because most of these types of occupancies are going to require one parking spot for 300 square feet of building area. And a parking spot is 300 square feet, a nine by um, a nine foot wide parking stall with the appropriate driveway area is about is right under 300 square feet so most of these occupancies you're, you're never going to get higher density than 50 percent you're just you're not you're not going to fit it on there you're not going to fit a store in there you're not going to fit a restaurant in there you're at a at a density higher than 50 percent of the lot okay Brooks? Yeah, a couple things I was going to 
mentioned most in some of the discussion was, you know, there are already some other things that differentiate this from our general business as far as setbacks and things too. So there's some additional space to differentiate that already in our draft. And then this is slightly different, but a couple other things based on some of the other comments that I wanted to say were there was talk of the 15, 15,000 foot building in the draft now would require just a little over an acre of lot. And I think that while I might agree that I don't expect to see that very often in this district, we just didn't see, I think it's kind of self-limiting because it takes that acre lot to do it. So I think it's it, it's sort of self-limiting, doesn't strictly rule it out, but it also kind of encourages and the most common thing that we should see is the 10,000 foot or less building in this, the way it's drafted. And then one other, I think it was brought up in reference to the possibility of a daycare that, you know, there's, there are some other, just want to remind that there are some enhancements to setbacks with this district in the draft at where it comes to the border that abuts the R1. So a side yard setback goes from seven to 15 where it touches R1 and a, I think it's the rear yard goes from 10 to 20 where it abuts. So there's, you know, I think something in here to help protect that, which is something I've been strong about since the beginning of this discussion, protecting that boundary. Okay. Bradley Walls, 609 North Tamarack Avenue. Um, going off of the conversation of central business and differentiating this uh, neighborhood business from that, I'm wondering what the intent is from the zero set, uh, zero sidelines or zero setbacks. So Side we yard, are yard. currently standing in our only central business. Yeah, no, one I'm block. Just, I so understand central, it, but central. we have that allowed inside of the neighborhood business. So I'm wondering what the intent is. Is that so that individual owners within a strip mall could, or, yeah, essentially a strip mall could own that property that they're sitting on? Because they're going to have to have separate, you know, walls in order to differentiate that they're different buildings, right? Are we, are we allowing for individually platted lots within a lot? It is in there right now. So, yeah, so we just, allow for that in general business, light right. industrial, heavy industrial, right? Correct. So if you own a, in all, in all business areas, so if you want to own a suite within a building, you can. So that's the purpose of zero setbacks. All right, so I'm looking for clarification on the verbiage then, because it's individually owned lots. So it's got to be owned by a common owner, correct? Yep. So how does, so they have to live in that lot in order for it to work, right? But they're only allowed one room? Are you talking about the residents? Or yeah, because the resident, the the resident has to be the owner, correct? The resident to live, we would have to be owner occupied to live in it, correct? Is that what we have written down? Correct, the residence yes. portion is owner occupied. Right, so then, so now that you can own I'm just, I'm just looking at it because it seems that it could be a way because I'm just looking, trying to get clarification on whether or not you can start stacking these buildings up next to each other and consider it in excess of 15,000 square feet. I know that it says on here that it has to be the total, but there's a little confusion around it, so I'm so just trying to look for clarification. Maybe an example of that You're welcome. Is, isn't on uh, Redwood Boulevard, the veterinary clinic, the, the, the fitness center, isn't that... Yeah. A commonly owned. Those are individual owned individual suites. Plats. They're individual yes. plats. Yeah. Okay. So that I don't know. I don't. I don't know if I would call it a strip mall, but you know the structure I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah. I know. That would be an example of what we're talking about there, where they're okay. individually owned buildings, but it's surrounded by the parking lot. Right. So yeah, I was just wondering intent behind that because I mean, kind of makes sense that you already have fifteen thousand square feet to work with. So I mean, does it really? Do you need to have those individually plotted lots? plotted lots it, it allows people to buy a piece of property okay so then how does that work if it's not owned by the same people then well they they, they buy individual lots so like right. the, the building he was talking about did you pull that up yeah yeah so I mean I'm just wondering if it gets so, grandfathered in if you currently live above it but then you sell the lot next to you so like you own all the lots right you plotted it you have four separate okay well we can look at this yeah so if one person owns all one, two, five of those, 
but they live in the current one and then they sell the other lots, does that not go against what is said about the zero setbacks? Because it has to be owned by one individual. So each lot has a separate owner. Okay, so you wouldn't be allowed to live there, correct then? No, you, each, each of those individual lots would be allowed to have. You could have five residents. Okay. Are we talking about okay. in general business or in neighborhood business? I thought we said we would not have zero setbacks at all in neighborhood uh, 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 business. No? Only in this type of an application. Individually applied and lots surrounded by common would have a zero setback. But that zero setback is only between the individual units. You still you still have the setback around them. So you so I thought we talked about that there would be no zero setbacks in neighborhood business under no okay, circumstances. So here, I understand. So you still have the setbacks around here. I understand, but I, this, I thought we were not allowing common, that in no, neighborhood business. Thing, still falls under the 10,000 or 15,000. I thought we were not going to allow that in neighborhood business, is what I remember. Well, the, But the whole structure would still fall under the square footage requirements. But I thought we were not going to allow zero setbacks under any circumstances in neighborhood business. Okay, why? I because that's my memory of what we okay. talked about. We talked about no zero setbacks, so you couldn't hook buildings together of greater than fifteen thousand or ten thousand square feet, so that you can't okay. take a ten thousand square foot building, hook another ten thousand square foot building to it. Okay. So the building size still has to stay of a certain size. If you want to break that up into four or five suites, that's it really comes down to an ownership thing. Where does it say, do have, okay, where, do where can I look here in this ordinance that gives me an idea of that? That's or if you have five owners yeah. in the same building. Yeah, I understand how that works. Thing. I know how that works. But where in the ordinance here will it tell me that that's okay? Let Patrick answer your question. Thank you. The current language is on page 17 into page 18 of the packet. 17 into 18? Okay, thank you. Um, so, I forgot your name, sorry, sir. Riley. Um, Mike. You, you brought up neighborhood utilities. So, neighborhood utilities currently are allowed in every zoning district across the board. Um, it's what allows and, you and to I, have I cable TV. I questioned this too when I was reading it. So, a, a neighborhood utility are, um, and I'll read it right from the ordinance telephone, electric, cable television lines, poles, equipment, water or gas pipes, mains, valves, sewer pipes lift stations, telephone exchanges, repeaters, uh, those kinds of things. They're not necessarily buildings like water treatment plants or things like that. And they are limited to 600 square feet as a maximum size. So does that answer your question when you brought that up? Okay. Okay. So the other one that's a conditional use was the Help me out here, Patrick. He usually calls it a public utility facility. Yeah, public utility. utility. That would be for for things like the water treatment plant. Or okay. We're not going to build another one of those, so don't worry about it. We're spending enough on the one we have. It's supposed to last over 50 years. I'll be way gone by then. Um, so, Tim, I... I do have just a couple other, just quick comments here. On yep. Page 14. Okay. Um, where we, under grocery and delicatessen, it says limited food sales. I, I'd like to eliminate that because we do allow restaurants in this. Okay. 
You get that, Patrick? Yep. Okay. Um, on page 16. Um, 15.9.10.3. If possible, off-street loading areas shall not be located in the yard abutting or adjacent to a residential property. Um, to me, the term "if possible" is kind of subjective. Sure. Um, you would like to remove "if possible." So, to me, the only situation where it would not be possible would be if that lot was surrounded on three sides by residential. Yep. Um, I'm, I just, if possible, to me is a very subjective term, depending on whether you're, whether you're uh, Paul trying to interpret what this means or whether you're the developer trying to put a building in and it's not possible because it doesn't function or flow correctly, so. <laughs> I would like it maybe to say something like, unless it's surrounded on yep. all three sides by, by residential. We spend years taking the gray, the gray out of things. <laughs> um, when we get to page 17, um, exception number 4.1, an opaque fence or wall not less than six feet high, but not extending within 15 feet of any street or driveway. Um, I would recommend we change that to 25 feet um, because that matches the front yard setback. And if this is against a residential neighborhood, we don't allow we don't allow fences over four foot high in a front yard in that first 25 feet. And so I don't think we would want the business next to a residential having a six foot fence right next to somebody's front yard. Does that make sense? Sure. You get that note, Patrick? Um, when we get to page 19, and we're we kind of had a blank there. I, Patrick highlighted the size of the uh, freestanding signs. Yes. Um, I would. I would make the suggestion to this to this committee that we go with 100 square feet and six foot tall, um, because that's what that matches R1, R2, R3, and R4. And so it would be no worse than than what we allow in in residential. Okay. Um, when we get to the next paragraph, um, I think the. Uh, the thousand square foot for temporary signs is too much for this this area, and I would like to see it maybe get reduced down to match R1, R2, R3, and R4. What about the giant pizza man? Yeah, I don't think we want a giant pizza man right next to somebody's front yard. Um, and then same thing on page 20. Um, so what did you say for temporary? What would you like that to be instead of a thousand? To match R1, R2, R3, and What R4. do we allow for a temporary there? Uh, I don't do we allow for temporary in yes, R1? Yes, we do. Do you remember what that is, Patrick, offhand? I don't. We don't see that very often because people don't. It's usually designed around, they'd be pretty small. It would be real estate signs and that kind of stuff. It wouldn't be big banner signs. Paul's feverishly looking it up, it looks like. For those, I think I can remember us talking about the yeah, yard sale signs and booster club signs and things like that. So it's literally... The, it's, it's like four or either. six square feet or something like that in R1. That we allow for? Yeah, an R1, one wall of freestanding signs should be allowed up to 180 days per year if it's larger than nine square feet but equal to less than 32 square feet in area. So 32. 32, 32. square feet. Paul, what's the uh, square footage? Four foot tall. So what's the square footage of one of those little floppy dudes that you put air into? <laughs> I'm not sure. 
Can, can you tell me the square footage of that? Because I don't know if those are allowable. I, I don't know, sir. That's why we... It would probably exceed four feet in height, though. So that's why we initially put it at 1,000, because yeah. if you're opening a business or having a sale or doing a grand opening, you do all those crazy things for a day or two, I just, which is why we allowed for it. I just, I just don't think we want to allow the exact same things that we have in uh, general business happening in this. You know, I think we need to scale it down. Okay. That's, that's, the, my, that's my understanding of the intent of this, is it's a little, it's a smaller scale. Okay. It's not the, the Walmarts, it's not the, the Sunshines, it's... I guess when it comes to temporary, it's going to be temporary. Well, temporary is up to 180 days, though. We can write that down, probably. Yeah. Change the, if you change the square footage on that one, it lists all the other uh, CB, GB, LI, HI. It's going to change all of them too, isn't it? For, yes. I mean... You're allowing a thousand feet for them, and NB was put in here. Should we just have NB separate so that well, we don't have to change all that? It, we put it in with the R1, R2, R3, R4 instead of the, the GB and CB. Yeah. So, I mean, if we want to, we could create a, a new one. But here again, I don't think we should allow the same um, amenities as what we have in CB. That's what we're trying to scale this back from a, a CB or a GB. Um, so, just to kind of keep moving here, um, page 20, we talk about fences. Uh, right now it says eight feet in height. I don't think we want to have an eight foot fence right next to a residential. So I'd recommend we scale that back to six foot. I thought we did eight foot on purpose next to a residential for more screening. We did. Mm, no, we have, we, did. we have six foot for screening. This says it's allowed. Uh, we require a six foot fence for screening. Yep. So the combination of those with this draft would be minimum of six, yeah. maximum of eight. So if you basically. go to page 17, um, item number four, we're an NB district abuts a lot or lot zone for development for residential use, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then it goes down to an opaque fence, not mm -hmm. less than six feet high. Yep. So this would make it, make the two match. We allow eight feet in industrial areas. I don't think we want eight feet eight foot fences right there. So this is not less than six feet. But it isn't the other one says up to eight feet. So right. that actually would be a combination of the both. Here again, I'm I don't I don't think I don't think people would want an eight foot fence right next to them. Maybe they do, I don't know. It blocks daylight. Yeah, but it also blocks what they're complaining about. The parking lot and the noise and the everything else. Big floppy sign. It's different than having a single family residence behind you. Okay. Six foot is we'll enough. In there. I, just, um, I can look over six foot I can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd rather look at a tree than a fence. I don't like fences. Yeah. I don't like trees opaque take too fences. Long to grow, though. Yeah. Yeah. And then they die, and somebody's got to. I don't want to rake either. It. So. So on page twenty-one, I had a question. Um, that first paragraph B, um, about halfway through there, no more than twenty-five percent of the required trees may be deciduous, ornamental, evergreen, or coniferous. What other kind of tree is there? <laughs> I wondered about that too. That's what's yeah. currently in there, That's though. That's what's currently so. in there. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Who wrote that? We do a lot for concrete trees. I, I I wasn't sure what the intent was on that. I don't. To not allow trees. So. Um, Other than ash trees, do we care too much with the? I don't think so. Unless the intent was 25% of them need to be evergreen trees, I don't know. 
I, yeah. I don't know what the intent of that was originally. Uh, I don't know. As long as they're planting trees. Okay. Um, bottom of page 21. Um, do we want to allow storage outside? N uh, Even by conditional uh, use. When you say storage and outside, you mean just in the parking lot? Well, it or just do you says mean... no outdoor sales, displays, seating areas, or storage may be placed except by conditional use. Do we even want do we even want to consider allowing storage outside? I, I I wouldn't. Maybe I mean give me an example of what an outdoor storage would be. It would be if you got material coming in and it sits outside. Um, okay. Instead of sitting inside your your business, whatever that may be. Obviously, if it's for sale, that's one thing. I mean, if a grocery store is selling Christmas trees and they they get a conditional use, they're not storing the trees there. Um, or if they set up a greenhouse, they're not storing plants; they're selling them. But if you have inventory coming in, you got a shipment of snowmobiles and they're stacked up outside. I just don't think we would want to allow storage of material in this district. I would, and it would be like behind Ace there. That's all full of their salt. storage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would be storage. Like that'd be their extra storage in the back. Yeah, I don't think that we would want that. The only other thing you can do is leave it in there and see how big of a problem it becomes if it does. Because you know we're going to end up rewriting this how many times? We have never done. ever rewrote an ordinance because they're all perfect. <laughs> Every time we've written one. Chuck? So those are just <laughs> some comments that I had some road time today. so that I love it. I had time to read it in a little more depth, but uh, I would, yeah, I maybe would agree with Chuck that, or I mean, or not. I, it, it's, I could go either way of the storage. I don't believe that we should have a, allow for outdoor storage. If you want to define what that is, that would be even better. Do we define storage? <laughs> it sounds like a crazy question, but we had to define a budding, so. I'll just say quickly, I remember discussing the other items here, but I was surprised that storage is in there, so I'm glad you mentioned that, because I, I, re I remember discussing outdoor sales, displays, maybe. Paul says there's no definition of storage currently in the zoning ordinance, so. We define we everything we else. Good luck. Uh, great question. We don't define it, so we don't know. Well, we're not allowing an accessory building, so yeah. Yes. So just a little history. We had an hour and a half meeting over the terms adjacent and abutting because they were mixed up in the ordinance. And they weren't necessarily defined in our definitions as synonyms. So we had to go through the entire ordinance trying to bring those two terms together. So, yes. That's why I asked if we decide to find storage. I'm okay with not allowing it, though, or either way. Uh, can I amend my comment? Please. Under storage is not a definition. There is a definition for outdoor storage. <gasps> we do? Do you want me to read it? Oh, I'd love it. Outdoor storage. The keeping in an unroofed area of any goods material, merchandise, or vehicles in the same place for more than 24 hours. Goods, materials, merchandise, or motor vehicles shall not include items listed, nor be of a nature as indicated in the definition of junkyard as defined herein. So you can't have a junkyard. Okay. But, so there is a definition for outdoor storage. That's what we're talking about here. So. Okay. Unroofed goods, materials, merchandise, or vehicles in the same spot for more than 24 hours. Okay. Does anybody have anything else to add to these questions of Patrick's? Or Patrick, do you have any other questions for us? Uh, 
how do we feel about the 10,050 or the 15,033? Do you want, how do, what do you want setbacks on those to be? Do you want the normal, the, the same setbacks scaled up or how do we want to do setbacks on so each of those? That, that seems to be the biggest question and yes, I, do you guys need to I left that portion of the chart open for do, your feedback. Do you guys want to go ahead, Brooks? I didn't. I don't feel like a change in setback is needed. The maximum building height is the same, and the only time I recall us talking about a scaling a setback was when there were maximum building heights much higher than this, and then we put in a sliding scale, to, so to speak. So, in, in my opinion, the for that reason, I don't think a setback needs to change in this zone, the way it's drafted. We already increased it from what we would normally have anyway. So anybody else have any thoughts on building size or setback or lot coverage? Those seem to be the big ones. Yeah, I, I did miss that. Um, I guess I did make a note on it. So um, I did notice that at one point, I don't remember where it was at in here now, um, but we say, um, where we talk about parking within setbacks. Um, at some point, it got changed that we allow we allow parking in setbacks if it does not abut residential. Okay, that's something I played around with last time. It basically comes down to whether you want. And Tammy I, and I talked about this this last week. Do you want those parking buffer strips in the parking lots? Yeah. So as I look at this. Um, I I would personally like to keep the setbacks in, even if it's um, NB to NB. And the reason for that is you could get very creative with um, with uh, access easements, and you could you could do an extremely large area. You could do a whole city block with no green space in the middle of it in this neighborhood except around the perimeter. And I don't think that's the intent of this. I think we want to keep it somewhat, you know, kind of a halfway between general business and, and residential character. So I think I personally would like to see us keep some of those those green strips in between the parcels. Keep the setbacks. Okay. Keep keep no parking in the setbacks. No parking in the setbacks. Yes. And it's a place to put snow. <laughs> well, there's always that. We don't get snow. And there's the, there's still room for some creativity with the zero lot line option, and the, and then that could bring in the shared parking. So there's still some ability to even limit parking in that stage. So there's some flexibility there for developers, builders, I would think. So I would agree with that. You know, so some of these munic municipalities that you know allow you to to do that. They also have other things in their codes to keep the trees and, and the green space, and they require you know a certain number of trees within the parking area. Um, you know, for every 50 parking stalls, you have to have a tree in, inside the parking area. So we don't have that, and so that's why I'd like like us to keep these no parking in the setbacks. Okay. On that graph on page 16. Where it goes to the 15,000 square foot. Um, the only thing I'd like to see changed in there from, uh, I'd like to see the setbacks remain the same as for the 10,000, but I think maybe the minimum lot width could be addressed. It could be a little larger, maybe, with a larger building. Okay, what does anybody think about that? Patrick, do you have any thoughts on that? Without sitting down and drawing things out, it's hard to think of a number right off the top of your head, what makes sense with the numbers on the widths. Okay. Brian, do you have any thoughts on that? Or Rob, lean on the builders?
I think that if you maintain the setbacks, that the lot width becomes sort of. I do like keeping the setbacks though. Yeah, it's gonna be pretty hard to do something that big. Yeah. Um, you know, and still keep fifty percent coverage in a narrow lot. Yeah. Sorry, 30% yeah. lot coverage. Yeah, it's going to just going to get smaller. Yeah. Okay. So we'll end up having it, which is fine. Yep. Okay. So then the other big question was lot coverage, whether it was buildable or, right? Yep. Buildable area or total lot. So what does everybody think about that? Buildable area. Buildable area, total lot. I see head shaking, so. Yep. I'm going to go like this. I think that's from some of the other ordinances and other municipalities. They were, most of those used buildable area for their calculation. Okay. Um, let me see here. Any concerns on the uses? Do we need to, we can come up with further definitions on things and refine them so we define exactly what they are, but are there sure. any, the ones highlighted that I kind of left open that we were discussing was appliance store, daycare center, the owner occupied dwelling and Vet service is small animal. We'd have to define what a small animal is. <laughs> Just Look. so you don't, I have a small cow, you know, bring it in. <laughs> so, but is, is there anything we particularly, if do you want to allow appliance store at all, we could define what an appliance is. But if you want to allow it at all, would you not, would you want to limit aspects of it, like, you can't we repair could do, things there. You strictly are a selling business, or uh, if it were retail without service, can you dictate that? Can you enforce it? Better yet, and that would be a Paul question. We limit the type of auto repair stores. Certain repair ones are conditional uses versus others. Okay, <laughs> but whether Paul wants to go into an appliance store and make sure they're not fixing, fixing anything. Things. I mean, when we write these ordinances, we all have to make sure that they're, you know, they can actually work and that they're enforceable. Is having an appliance store in the neighborhood business just pushing a general business business into neighborhood business? Should Is one place more appropriate? I don't know. That's when I was thinking of appliance store, I was thinking of small appliances that you could put on a shelf, not standalone washers and dryers and uh, things of that nature. The way it's written here, my interpretation would be something like a Carl's. That's kind of the broadest sense of it, whether we want to further define it or it's not right at all. That's a you question. Um, it's really hard to dictate based on, well, the deliveries are going to come by a straight truck or a semi-truck. Because um, even the people that, you know, in some of these shops, they don't know how something's going to come. No. Um, but I think an appliance store, most of that product is going to be coming from probably pretty large trucks. Um, so I would, I would venture to say not allow it. Okay. I'm okay with the occasional semi-truck in this area, but I don't know if we want that as the daily. You know, Budweiser delivers with a semi-truck, just saying. In, in, Turn your mic on. In this particular case, they would be delivering off of Redwood, which is a truck route anyway, but other neighborhood business districts might not be on that bigger road where we wouldn't necessarily want great big trucks coming in 
does that make it a conditional use rather than permitted, depending on its access? I don't know. You mean the appliance store? Yes. I mean, would there be some appliance stores that would be and be appropriate if their location was correct? Yes, sir. I was going down the TJ Bartman 1016 South Nicholas. I was going down that same path. Uh, it is a truck route. That road has more semis on it than probably any other road in this town. So to now say we can't have a semi on that road makes pretty doesn't make a lot of sense. That is a truck route. Exactly what you said. So neighborhood uh, business will be in other parts of the town too. I agree. Eventually. Yeah, that's why I was saying where you were going with if you have to have some type of a conditional use permit or how this fits into that is a tough question but for this particular lot there is no street that has more semis on it than this one so to now say we can't have a semi on this road doesn't make doesn't make sense um we do allow i mean the nice thing about the conditional use process is that's supposed to let us look at each property individually as it comes up whether it's for whatever reason, we we listen to a lot of conditional uses, so I'm, I'm usually not in favor because the conditional uses are up to opinions a lot of times, unfortunately. And we do we have anything that we have written into this ordinance that's allowable by conditional use? Outdoor sales, display seating areas no longer storage in conduction with a principal land use, drive up windows for a permitted use, electrical substation, laundry service, public utility facility, and the small animal bat services are currently our list of conditional uses. Okay. So maybe that would be how we handle this, would be by conditional use. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. Does that make sense? Um, are, you, are you still talking about large appliance uh, appliances? Nope. Just the mm -hmm. appliance store in general. The appliance store the, in the, general. The, the category of it, unless you want to define what an appliance store is. No, I would say, I would say take appliance store out of there as a use. Allow it by conditional use or no use at all. That I don't have a strong opinion on. I'd be okay with conditional. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Because in, in this situation, yeah, we are on a, a major truck route here, but I don't think we want to leave it in here on a collector street, which is what this neighborhood business is really intended for. We yes, we allow for a lot. I mean, so I have a when when if somebody wants to buy a liquor license, that's also done by conditional use, correct? Correct. And with those conditions, we can set hours. Typically, you could. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, you, you can set as conditions are broad. It has to relate to the activity on site. You can't set a condition that has nothing to do with correct what the use is. Yes. Like you must install a fence on your property halfway across town to get a condition on that. I get you it. couldn't do it. it yeah. There's a nexus there. But y yes, anything to protect health, safety, and welfare is generally what conditions are used for. Okay. Yes, sir. Can I just bring a hint of realism to this? This is Brandon. This is a bedroom community. How many of you are going to buy? Yeah, right? Bedroom Shocking. <gasps> um, how many of you are going to go and buy a washing machine or a stove from a, a small appliance store in town here versus going to Carl's or Best Buy or some other, you know, big shop like that? As a city council member, I'd love to see the sales tax dollars stay in Brandon. I'm sure you would, but I sure wouldn't buy one here. They couldn't, they couldn't afford it. If more people bought stuff here, we wouldn't have the problems we have. Just saying. This, this town needs to go away from that bedroom community. And yeah. We have a furniture business. store here. That's what they need to do. It's a bedroom, it, yeah, it's a bedroom community because most people work in Sioux Falls I know and that, buy there. We're, gonna, we're eventually getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Now we're going to get away from that bedroom community. So if we're, if we're okay. Like, okay, how about going back to next to a residential place? Is a Carl's or larger does that fit in the neighborhood? Forget past flower in a residential neighborhood. Does that belong? Conditional use. 
Conditional use. Okay. Anything else? What else have we got? Um, as I've tried to reiterate in the emails I've sent out to people that have provided public comments, everything in this district is open for conversation. Nothing has been locked in stone. If anyone has anything, for some reason, we just haven't thought of that would be appropriate for the district. I'm open to those thoughts as well. Daycares have come up as some people say none at all. Some people say conditional. Some say permitted. We need them. So this currently has them as permitted. Is everyone okay with that based on what we talked about earlier, how they are allowed in residential, maybe not daycare center so much as in home? How do we feel about those? And the 24-hour gym concept was brought up earlier as well. Are those appropriate for this district? Those are kind of the, the ones I hear about consistently when people provide comments, those three things. As far as a daycare center, uh, Paul, don't we have a lot of restrictions on how they handle daycares, uh, hours of operation, uh, the, How many they can have there and size and all that? The state licenses them. State? But we don't. Yeah. We don't here. We don't. We, we, don't, we don't write the rules for daycares. The state does. We and the have state licenses them like, and enforces them. Yeah, there's a fence. Yeah, we have things like they need to have a fence. And um, I don't think we require that they have a fence. We ask them if they have one. I think there is. Maybe in daycare centers we require that they have a fence. And maybe the state actually dictates that they have to keep the children inside of a fence, but as far as residential, we do not say where they have to keep children. And doesn't the state say you can only have your building, you can only have so many kids per this big a building, and you can only have this? I don't know. I think all of our current daycares are right now adjacent to residential. They are. Yeah, except the one, yeah. That one's a block off from residential hill. Yeah. Which one? The one across across from the bluffs. Over by the yep. yep. That's the only one that's not. All the others are either right across the street or immediately adjacent to residential. So under home occupations, under group uh, daycares, you must provide a safe playground area with a fence of at least four feet in height. Okay. That is the home occupation in home daycare. Whether the state would require you to have a outdoor fenced area for a daycare center that's a standalone business, we, I don't we, know. But, it, but, it seems yeah. reasonable they probably would, They, but I don't know. Yes. So allow daycares? I'm okay with it. I would. I see a bunch of this again. Okay. All right. What other questions do you have? Um, that's pretty much what I have, unless anyone sees anything. And we'll have a new draft at the next meeting, and hopefully we'll get some feedback on it, and we can continue moving towards hopefully something workable. So you think by next meeting we'll have a draft? We'll have a draft every meeting, but hopefully I mean, it'll be like a, a little bit like, updated. But like one that <laughs> one that doesn't have all these highlighted questions at the end. Unless there there are more that come in that look pressing, but I, I I hope we're getting closer to having something. And of course, much like everything, zoning <laughs> things change over time. You try <laughs> things out. Some things work well, others don't. Sometimes it takes minor tweaks, so I'm sure we will revisit everything again in the future. We've revisited off-street parking probably several times every year, so things will constantly be looked at and changed to make workable. So what comes out at the end of this process is not necessarily the end of the road. If things need to be improved, we will do what we need to do to improve them. 
Okay, anybody else have anything to add to this? Anyone? That was a lot. Okay. Hearing nothing else on neighborhood business, we'll move on to vacation home rentals ordinance draft. I guess my question would be, do we need to do this? So Paul was on some email communication with people from around the state about vacation home rentals without truck you know, without, I don't want to speak for them, but it's my understanding the city of Sioux Falls' position is they would like to know where they are, but they don't necessarily care to regulate them. Yeah. So No permits, no inspections, and, no fees. And obviously we're not the city of Sioux Falls, so we can certainly do something different. Now it, 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 it's it up is. It's to you what you'd want to do. So when they do rent an Airbnb or a VRBO, they... They do pay the third penny sales tax, is that correct? I don't it's, know about that. that. That wasn't brought up, sir. I'm not sure. I believe it's collected by the site and remitted back to the city. Okay. Tammy is shaking her head yes. I think so. Yeah. I can look at it again. That's outside of what we do here, though. Well, yes, but it. I mean, the biggest reason that we have an ordinance for things like hotel rooms is the same thing. So we don't. We don't. No. that in any of our nope. other ordinances on any other business. No, nope. we, we, don't, we don't not allow rentals in, in neighborhoods. You can rent your house today if you want to. So as far as I'm aware, there are, I think we looked and there were two in town. So where this came from is we had someone call City Hall wondering what they needed to do to have a verbo. I talked, we, Brian, the city administrator, I, we, Paul, we talked about it, and kind of right now without further guidance on them, would you consider a verbo a home occupation? That's kind of where we, we sat. The obvious problem there is there are very specific rules on home occupation. So that's not necessarily a square fit. You know, it's trying to jam something that doesn't necessarily fit. Because well, you're limited to the amount of the home it can take up, that kind of thing. And if it's a verbo, people aren't going to respect that anymore. Home use, tax, so, retail service, do we care to regulate uh, them? Useful, when it comes down to? Receipts, do the neighbors care the if okay. someone sets up a yeah. verbo next to their house? Penny. Would yep. you care how it is operated? Well, there are other types of rentals other than the entire structure. Yep. You can rent a room, you can rent the basement, you can rent a loft above a garage. Um, so yes, I think we do need to address this. You think you need to address the Airbnb VRBO? Or just the well, vacation we, rental? If, especially if somebody wants to rent out a portion of their house, then it needs to become a home occupation, just like any other business out of their home. There's, I mean, I know with like traveling nurses and stuff, there's a, another website called like Furnish Finder. It's for traveling nurses and they go rent a room in a house. That someone's renting, so to be like your example there. But to me, if, if somebody wants to buy a house and rent it out, that's no different than if they rent it out on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, or a yearly basis. Yeah, I I really don't care. Nope. But if somebody wants to rent out a portion of their house, then to me that becomes a home occupation, and we should address it like we do a daycare or any other home occupation. So if I buy a house expressively to turn it into a VRBO, then I'd be renting the whole house. So that's allowable. But if I own the house and I live in it and I want to rent out a room as a VRBO, then that do you want to monitor? I've I've rented a house out on uh, I don't know what what is it, VRBO sure. or Airbnb and the homeowner's upstairs and I was downstairs. Yep. So there was still I mean that was out. the whole intention of Airbnb when it started was to rent a room. Mm -hmm. And you know we really don't um, we don't dictate how many you know, like kids you can have in your house. I wouldn't get into regulating all this yet. Yeah, it's just I don't know. That's a lot to enforce. Yeah, Barb Fish, uh, fourteen oh one South Parkview Place in Brandon. Um, so there was just a couple of news stories about uh, people renting uh, Airbnbs and they passed away from carbon monoxide poisoning. 
And so, of course, there's a lawsuit. I don't know that the city wants to get involved in all of that, so I would agree with, with uh, Chuck and... Not regulate them? Leave it up to the homeowner? Well, unless we're going to go in and make sure that, you know, they're all up to snuff and we don't we, have staffing for that. No. I, I, I would be concerned that we, that it, would happen. And the other, the other concern was that if they were renting to people who were becoming unruly, it would be a call to the police, just like if you owned the house and were being unruly in it. I don't think that, I mean, just because people own houses doesn't mean they're always painted saints in them. So leave well enough alone? I think so. The, the place I've probably seen this is in areas where there's lots and lots and lots of vacation rentals. Sometimes there'll be regulations that, where some areas say, hey, if you own a place here, you can only rent up to so many days a year. But that's in a place where there's hundreds and maybe thousands of rentals on the coast and things. I've seen that. But Are you saying I don't think we have that. Brandon, South today. Dakota is not a tourism hot spot. <laughs> McCarty Park is bringing them in from all over, man. In its way, it might be, a, but I don't think it's going to be a VPRO hot spot right now. Probably not. Yeah. No. Yeah. It will when you it is your house. Yes. Tim lives here. Yes. Of course. So I think that's leave well enough alone. Okay. Next, building permits for November. Paul, you haven't built enough houses. Are you going to get another 40 permits before the end of the year? It's possible. Anything's possible, sir. Are any coming in, or are we done with permits for the year? There's no pending permits. Okay. Gotcha. Take them as they come. Very good. It was a little slower than last year, but I'd say last year was pretty good. Yeah. There's a lot of factors. Yeah. Okay. I'll make a motion. Two. Adjourn. Perfect. Motion to adjourn. Second. And a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned at eight twelve.